we just want to welcome folks who will be viewing this message on the, the book of Jonah in the months ahead. And we are coming from Grace United Church in Coombs, British Columbia, and it is November the 19th, 2023. Glad to have you as part of this extended church family. You know, there are a few Old Testament stories that really capture the imagination for many generations. Uh, we think of the parting of the Red Sea, you know, think of Charlton Heston, maybe for those of us who are around to see that movie, or David and Goliath, uh, the story of Noah and the ark. And then this funny little four chapter book in the, the minor prophets in the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, which has this very, very interesting story. And we're going to be talking about that. And it ends up in secular stories like Moby Dick and in Disney's Pinocchio, where there is a person who is either against this big whale or a fish that kind of swallows Pinocchio. Now, you might wonder if you read it, but probably most of you at least have heard the story. You wonder whether it was true or not, don't you? Most modern kind of theological scholars think that it's a parable. And kind of like Jesus, when he tells parables, the disciples don't say, now, Jesus, did that really happen? No, they're wondering, what's the main point? What is the parable really all about? And parables are there to make us kind of ruminate or think about the story that we've heard, to apply it to our lives, or to understand the world around us, or to get a message from God. And I think this parable that uses humor and hyperbole is intended to impart some very important truths. And for me, I believe the key to unlocking some of the deepest truths comes through that question that God asked Jonah in that final chapter that you heard Joe read. The question God asked in different translations, you had a little different one, but the one in the New International is this question that God asks Jonah. Have you any right to be angry? Have you any right to be angry? Let me refresh your memory of the story of Jonah. This disobedient Hebrew prophet hears God call him to go and preach to this large city of Nineveh, which is in modern day Turkey. These are non-Jewish people. And this good Jewish boy, Jonah, thinks this is not the assignment for me. And so instead he disobeys God and he heads in the opposite direction, boards a ship going towards what is now modern day Spain. Now, during the voyage, a big storm lashes the ship and the non-Jewish sailors find Jonah asleep in the hold. I mean, everyone's in a panic except for this Jewish person. Now, when they wake Jonah up, uh, he recognizes that this is a storm sent by God to get his attention. And he doesn't want the whole ship to be destroyed. And so he says, well, you may as well throw me overboard. And of course, the prophet walks the plank, the storm dies down, but to Jonah's surprise, instead of drowning, which one would assume would happen, God sends a big fish who swallows his, him up, and in the belly of the fish, the prophet for three days is desperate, so desperate, he prays for his death? No. He prays for deliverance different from what he prayed for in Jonah chapter four, which is, I wish I was dead. But in the belly of that fish, he prays for deliverance, something that he wasn't willing to do in terms of being a prophet to those foreigners. He wasn't willing to pray for them. He prays for himself. Now, Jonah is very happy when God hears his prayer and the fish gets indigestion and spits Jonah out three days later in what could only be described as a seafood chowder. <laughs> Smelly and white from the digestive juices of the fish, Jonah reluctantly follows God's instructions to go to Nineveh and proclaim this message intended to call forth repentance and salvation for a non-Jewish people. Now, you need to know why Jonah was really so angry at God for calling him in the first place to go to Nineveh. Because 
Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, is a place where there is very bad, bad blood between the Israelite nation and the Assyrian people. The Assyrians were a large nation and they had come down and conquered Israel. So naturally, the people who had been subjugated to all of the atrocities of the Assyrian people, they're angry. And for generations, they kind of have this anger stowed up against these foreigners. And so Jonah has this kind of cultural anger against the people that the nation's been warring for some time. I guess it's understandable, right? That's why he hesitated and was disobedient to the call of God to go to the Ninevites and preach repentance. Now, back to the story. Jonah arrives in Nineveh. He's so ticked off at God and the inhabitants, but reluctantly he delivers God's message, which is 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. In what can only be seen as this complete twist in the story, it says that the people of Nineveh, led by their king, repent. And the scriptures say that God heard how they had turned away from their evil, wicked ways and had compassion on them. That's the end of the story, right? No. Because Jonah is really ticked off now. He is not a happy camper. He's even more angry than before because he can't believe that God spared Sin City through Jonah's ominous message. And so like a, a petulant child, you know, Jonah kind of cursing under his breath and kicking at the dirt, he goes up to a top of the hill that overlooks Nineveh. And of course, he's hoping for destruction of the city, but in actual fact, God doesn't rain down destruction. God saves the city. Jonah can't understand why God wouldn't wipe out the city from the face of the earth. He can't grasp the grace of God towards the people who he believes do not deserve God's love and mercy. And God sees how angry this prophet is and asks, have you any right to be angry? Lauren Ferguson Wilbert says in response to this story of Jonah, most of our anger, thinking personally, most of our anger, I think, comes when something we expect doesn't happen or when something happens that we didn't expect. Something in our sense of how the world should be or how our life should be kind of splits apart and we're left with emotions like an anger. And all of us have faced that. All of us have felt that. When you think God is on your side, when you pray, believing that God should do a miracle for you and God doesn't answer the prayer you the way you think it should, sometimes you get a little angry at God. Or if something happens in your family, you know, and there's a split in it and you think that family should all be perfect, you know, like leave it to Beaver or, you know, what was the one with the mixed family? You know, they all came together. The Brady Bunch. Have you ever lived in a Brady Bunch home? Yes. Yes. Well, isn't that wonderful for you, Marion? <laughs> Most of us don't. So when something you expect God should do doesn't happen, sometimes you can feel angry. Sometimes when unexpected things happen that you see are very negative to you and, and your emotions rise up and you get angry as well. I've experienced that. Perhaps Jonah was angry for that very reason. Unmet expectations. He expects his enemies to be God's enemies. And when he realizes that that's not the case, he is raging mad precisely because he believes God's wrath should consume the enemies of Israel. All the while, it is God's mercy and grace that is on display for everyone to see. As I was working on this message I couldn't help but feel that today, in this time, we live in a culture full of Jonas. We live in a culture full of angry people, and so many people feel that they have a divine right to be angry. Am I the only one, or does anybody else feel like over the last decade or so, we've become angrier societies? We see this played out on social media, 
in the news every day, angry people, business moguls like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, you know, challenging one another to a cage fight. Like these are grown men, billionaires, and here they can't control their emotions and anger. And of course, that gives permission for everyone else to also feel that they have a right to display their anger front and center, no matter who it offends or no matter if it really, if it kind of produces violence. And oftentimes that's exactly what it does. And you witness this, of course, in, uh, in politicians. Remember down in the States last week, wasn't there a politician who got mad and challenged one of the witnesses to a fight outside? Like, what has the world come to, you think? Ever since the events of October 7th, with the ensuing war between Israel and Hamas, with, of course, we know the, the casualties on all sides, particularly the Palestinians, we've seen riots on university campuses and in streets and major cities all over the Western world, certainly in the Middle East. And we've seen angry pro-Palestinian protesters calling for the destruction of Israel. We've seen angry Israeli citizens taking out retribution on the Palestinian population in the West Bank. We've witnessed the rise of anti-Semitic destructive acts in so many places around our nation and the world. A few weeks back, my aunt who lives in Vancouver called me and asked if we could put her rabbi on our prayer list, because here's this rabbi, kind of like a normal rabbi, like a pastor or a priest, and someone found out where he lived, and they spray painted swastikas and stuff all over his house. Well, you can imagine that kind of upsets people. I'm sure there are many contributing factors to this disturbing trend, but in the scripture passage today, the question we need to ask ourselves first and might be good for society to also ask is the one asked by God of Jonah. Have you any right to be angry? Now, certainly, there is a righteous anger that we can feel when the world we see around us is hurting so many people. There is a righteous anger, and you see that thread of righteous anger throughout the scriptures and certainly into Jesus, right? After all, Jesus did flip the temple tables and the prophets are often filled with this righteous anger for the injustices that they saw within their own nation and the nations around them. So certainly we know there's a place for righteous anger to be felt that moves us towards action because God wants us to confront injustices. The problem comes, I think, when our anger sits quietly in our souls and eats us from the inside out. And I think so many people are affected by that. They get angry and it starts to eat them from the inside out. I'm talking about the anger we hold on to because it's easier to feel angry than it is to look within and to do some deep soul work, finding out what the real problem is. What is the, the kind of the root cause of that anger? And is it something that perhaps I need to attend to in my life so that that anger doesn't boil over from me and then it affects my family or it affects people beyond that? And I'm talking about an anger that expands and rises to a level in society where hundreds or thousands are enraged and they're looking for a place to focus that anger. And sure enough, you know they're going to find a place to focus that anger. And that's what we see all over social media. We have a lot of angry people. They don't know where it comes from. They think they know where it comes from. And they don't mind ex expressing that in kind of negative behavior, either online, because you can be anonymous, or out in the streets. The problem that I think the book of Jonah is in part bringing to the surface is that even when anger stems from a righteous cause against some injustice, it has the potential to seep into our bones, our psyches, our souls, and twist the anger till it becomes hatred for another. That's when you've got a real problem. 
And I believe that that's what happening, that is happening in so many places around the world. A whole bunch of angry people who see those who disagree with them as the enemy, resulting in fractured societies and arise in acts of violence in so many places. In a time before Christ, when the Hebrew people were justifying their belief that God was on their sides and their enemies were God's enemies, comes this little parable of Jonah, which calls into question this very basic premise upon which so many wars have started. We've been wronged and we're going to get, you know, we're going to get vengeance because now you're my enemy. This book of Jonah, this parable of Jonah, is this contrarian perspective that should give everyone pause to reflect on where all our present anger and hatred is heading. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, in what we call the Sermon on the Plain, there's an equivalent sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, but I tell you, love your enemies do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Now, when Jesus says, love and pray for your enemies, perhaps this little parable of Jonah was going through his mind because he lived in an angry society. He knew what oppressors, this time it wasn't the Assyrians, it was the Romans, were doing to the nation of Israel. He had a righteous anger to see justice fulfilled, but Jesus understands how real peace happens, and it isn't by angry men in particular going to battle. That oftentimes doesn't end in peace. Sometimes you need to go. I understand that. There is a kind of a fine line between all these things. But in our day and age, when anger is just boiling under the surface, all it takes is a spark. And then it lets loose. And now people who were your next door neighbors are your enemies. People who are, you know, the country next to you are your enemies. The story of Jonah, this angry prophet who would rather die than look to God to help him deal with the misplaced anger that's eating him up inside. Remember that plant got eaten by a worm, right? I've seen lots of people eaten up on the inside by anger that they've been holding on to because they can't release it. Jonah's so mad, he won't pray for the people or pray for God to soften his own heart because he'd rather hold on to that anger. Jesus understands the heart of God and says, love your enemies, pray for those who wronged you. Now, why would Jesus say that? Makes no sense, Jesus. Well, first off, I think God is a God who longs for peace between people so that the real work of lifting up and caring for the poor, the dispossessed, the refugees, the orphans doesn't get hijacked by angry people looking for an enemy and then all of the mess behind that we're supposed to be looking after doesn't get done because our focus is on our enemy and we're going to look for a way to get revenge. But more than that, perhaps Jesus knows that misplaced anger rots our souls and is opposed to the purposes of God. Jesus knows that misplaced anger, when allowed to fester, can lead to violence and seeing others as the enemy. Today, we need to see people who disagree with us not as enemies. We need to seek and find common ground and really take the time to hear their stories, to understand where their anger or misplaced anger might reside. We need to look for ways to build bridges towards, to join people together who have different opinions. In any diverse society, you're going to have a lot of different opinions, aren't you? But they should not end up in violence because it destroys the very core of what God wants to do in building God's kingdom in this world, which is also a kingdom of peace and justice. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, writes, Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. I appreciate Paul gives you permission to be angry. That's what he says. Be angry. Because there are times when you're going to feel angry. 
This is a natural human response to injustice or when things don't go your way. I understand that. God understands that. He gave us the emotion of anger. But Paul's admonition is don't let the sun go down on that. In other words, don't sit with your anger for so long that it starts to eat you from the inside out and create so many problems for you that you can't sleep at night or that you're looking for ways to get revenge or you're looking for a way to kind of put your anger out there. Don't let your son, don't let the sun go down in your anger. In other words, it's fine to be angry, but don't hold on too long. Don't let it fester. Don't let it burn within you to the point where it explodes outwards and causes so many more problems. Did you notice in our Jonah parable how God lets Jonah feel angry for that day? God said, it's okay, Jonah, you can be angry for that day. God even gives a plant to give Jonah shade while he's sulking which I think is kind of a brilliant thing that God gives him some shade while he's angry. But after one day, God causes the plant to wither and confronts Jonah about his anger. Do you have the right to be angry, Jonah? Do you have a right to be angry about this plant that you didn't grow and about these people that you didn't create, create whom I love? I wonder if that's a question we should ask ourselves a little more often. Do I have a right for my anger? Do I have a right to hold on to it until it burns me and the people around me. Jonah's story, the parable, calls us to be careful about misplaced anger. And Jesus' message calls us to love and pray for our enemies, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. No doubt. Do you think Jesus asks us to do easy things? Any old prophet can ask you to do easy things. Jesus the prophet and son of God comes to this world to ask us to do the hard things because it's in doing the hard things that the, the societies change. It's doing the hard things that hearts change. It's in doing the hard things that communities of faith change all for the better. I firmly believe that we and our society needs to pay attention to the rise of anger and realize how much anger costs us in our society if we choose to hold on to it. Amen.